FUCKING <laughs> If you've been paying attention to some of the edits in my videos, you see that I reference Jujutsu Kaisen a lot. Hell, my first video is an analysis on Megami Fushigiro, who is still my favorite character despite his stocks looking kinda shaky. For God's sake, MAKE SOMETHING OF YOURSELF! This goes without saying that I'm a pretty casual fan of Jujutsu Kaisen. Man, this shit Loki sucks. From its music, voice acting, animation, <laughs> trash ass story. It really is something that effectively captures its audience. If it was for the good ass animation, y'all would've been slept on this John. Okay, yo, who is that? Who keeps on talking? Man, who else you think? Who you? Man, this draconian ducks. Me first, God second. What? So you like my old ego or something? What's going on? And that's exactly what this is. And for a show like this, it deserves to roast Bill. So step aside and let me do it. I bet if you really my old ego, say son only I would say on the count of three. One, two, don't, don't make him have to get, get cut like like true and see. Matter of fact, no, 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 right, right now. now you and me. me. Oh fuck! You are my old ego in chain, bitch. <laughs> Now there's only one bit left. Jujutsu Kaisen is, in its purest essence, a good battle series, and that's it. It's not no deep philosophical or overly spiritually insightful series many claim it to be just because it leads itself into presenting such themes. It excels when it shows your favorite characters throwing hands because the story that drives the series is mediocre at best and vacant at worst. That doesn't mean the series as a whole is bad, but it's definitely been propped up in a manner which has disguised itself into allowing the masses into thinking it's a credible narrative. The common misdirection is that it will take the narrative and concept of a character and amplify the story as a whole, where the fans would typically associate the quality of how certain characters are written, bypass the non-existent story, and then conflate the two into creating this diluted perspective that what we're seeing is a stroke of literary genius, when in fact, it's the complete opposite, it's complete ass. Example, when certain character A, fought certain character B. During that whole event, the attachment we had to this amazing spectacle was so hyperinflated, it distorted our perception of what story was there. Now of course, when that event ended, transitioning into a different one, many fallibilities were once again made clear. If you're not catching on to it right now, then don't worry, you will when I get to that specific fight, cause trust me there's a fuck ton to unpack with that one. See. The anime assists purely, almost entirely, as to why the popularity of this series has reached such a claim. Naturally, all anime adapted from its source material triggers that function. Demon Slayer, Bleach, Fate, Hunter x Hunter, Attack on Titan. While some are better than others, the anime makes that statement. In the case of Jujutsu Kaisen, the anime is the statement, and thus the illusion, a mirage, that what we're seeing is not as deep as you want to believe. And not only has this story been trashed for a long ass time, but it was doomed to fail from the jump. Now before I proceed, this video does contain spoilers in it, and I will be discussing crucial events from the manga, so anime watches be advised. Now for those that don't get any ass because you think you're too cool for anime, Jujutsu Kaisen is a shonen battle series written by Gege Akatame. It was first initially conceived in 2017 with a one shot, Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, following its intended protagonist, Yuta Okotsu. It later received unanimous approval from the Civilization Committee to have the series continued, and it officially launched in March of 2018. It follows the story of a teenager, Itadori Yuji, swallowing a cursed object which happened to be the finger of the most demonic sorcerer to exist in the old era. Since his body was able to serve as a powerful vessel for the finger, it was agreed upon by Central 46, I mean, the CIA, that he'd be used as a radar of sorts to locate the other remaining 20 fingers, and then he'd be executed. Now granted, the plot is nothing spectacular, but we try to understand the importance of this because Yuji's grandfather's last words were to help as many people as possible, which served as a driving motivator for Yuji to be as strong and always be of use to people and his friends and others, which also explains as to why he feels so heavily upon failing and he fell down a gutter when Sukuna ran the fade that decimated the entire city. The baseline plot to most shows aren't that interesting because it's dependent on the characters and the mechanisms to further drive and evolve the story. However, when you have a bunch of characters that you have no idea how to effectively utilize, not only does the story suffer, but the shit components of that story, the characters, themes, setting, and other literary values of the narrative suffer greatly as well. That being said, I'm gonna start with the world building. It's non-existent. It's set in Japan. Sometimes you'll see user in Africa or Cuba or some shit, but the world of Jujutsu Kaisen isn't as interesting or even feels like a world. Naturally, up until the Shibuya arc, the sorcerers made it very apparent to hide themselves from the human world, so we automatically have this function to ignore any surrounding events as do the characters up to the Shibuya arc. It's neither good or bad, 
it just happens to take place in Japan. It isn't like Bleach with three distinct worlds, Hunter x Hunter with its very different lands, and, in my opinion, one of the greatest illustrations of world building, One Piece with its complex multiplicity of intricate geopolitical layering of varied identities with its nations, islands, and everything else in between. Even Night City has an identity in its own right, because real talk, if you ask me to live in either Night City or Gotham, I am picking Gotham 100%. Night City is way worse than Gotham, and I would debate y'all on that. We gotta be forgiving for the lack of identity Japan has in this world because it's clearly not the pivotal point of focus despite it being suggested. There is no strong effort in discerning itself as a quality, and therefore, I think it'd be pretty disingenuous to harshly deduct points from this series based on that. Nah, fuck that. Spoiler alert. Before Shibuya, Kenjaku pulls up to the White House and he announces the existence of Cursed Energy, Cursed Spirits, and Jujutsu Society, all for the desire of abducting humans. Understanding it to be a valuable source of renewable energy, the humans, after a couple pages of pushback, identified that the arms race would be problematic if other nations got word of this, even though Kenjaku went to other nations with this supposed plan. I say all this because over 50 chapters post this moment is not further expanded upon and Kenjaku dies. While it could be a plot point later remains uncertain, hence why I will refrain from mass critique right now, but this is a common theme of Gege introducing something, only to seemingly forget about it. Have it reach an unsatisfying conclusion, or when he remembers what he wrote before, he'll tie it back to the main story in a very cheap way, something he does a lot. But the point being, the world here is nothing compelling at large. Because the world is already confined within a narrative, your characters must excel to greater capacity, which leads me to my first argument. The writing for these characters are not good when looked as a collective system as opposed to individually evaluated. This is to say that they exist within the story and the objects around them as opposed to being viewed as singular agents interacting with other agents. For instance, Team Gojo did not develop enough as a collective to qualify as a group to be viewed as a team compared to how you would view Squad 7 or Team Urameshi. With Yuji being the only one who had a genuine relationship with both Nobura and Megumi, Megumi and Nobura felt more like passing co-workers to the extent of their conversation and stretched past catching up on a water machine. You know Yuji's dead, right? Yeah. Anyway, back to work. Excluding the one time they all fought the death painting bros, Yuji was the only one who had a meaningful connection with both Nobara and Megami, which felt like the three lacked as a sense purpose as a unit and even as a team. I don't even think Gojo talked to Nobara, like, ever. We also see this with the Kyoto team. That trash ass Kyoto team. That trash ass, that sorry ass, that trap. Matter of fact, let me quickly express how much I hate every single one of y'all. Miwa, trash. Udahime, substitute level teaching. Mekamaru, rat. My, you can only shoot one cursed bullet a day before you pass out. So you ain't even worth talking about for real, for real. Your biggest contribution was Bloodbender, Sue Your Barber, Broom Girl. <laughs> you make me mad. Toto, you are the LeBron James to the 2018 Cavs. Most of these characters that were introduced failed to hold weight to the story, which made their story and character arc feel so pathetic. Spoiler alert. Mai's purpose was only to exist as this convenient component to greatly amplify Maki's abilities. However, outside of these two sisters fighting, not enough time was established between them to greatly generate a strong and tenable emotional element to the moment to where Mai sacrificed herself for Maki. We see this in small glimpses in her outlook of her sister as someone she deems less than having no cursed energy, but ultimately suffers from abandonment and inferiority complex which withholds further disdain towards Maki for abandoning her. But this was done for anime watchers in one episode, and it never developed past that up until her death. In that light, it felt like her entire character was disgraced purely for Maki who evolved into the second coming of Toji. Miwa and Broom Girl are barely characters and they have not affected the story or anyone around them in any significant way. Mekamaru does not count because that led nowhere and that felt very abrupt. However, we see this trend consistently. Introduce, discard. Introduce, discard. However, despite Mekamaru being a rat, I will give him a pass. His death and his actions did contribute heavily to the Shibuya arc, and even though he wasn't given enough screen time, relative to his other co-workers, he stood out the most. Besides Toto. For the most part, it's a technicality in not what these characters do, but more so what they say, and whenever their big moment comes, it usually comes at the ending point of their life cycle. Which showcases Gege's inability to write consistently or within more basic confines. When he tries his hand to overcomplicate concepts, I can't help but look at such attempts as another watered down, sugar and gluten free, seasonless variation of Bleach or Hunter x Hunter, with his power concepts similar to Hatsu and Nen and domain expansions with similar conditions and restrictions to Nen. Even a binding vow, this feels like a type of restriction. 
while you have your more simple punch kick characters like Maki and Yuji, yes I know Yuji has his thing going on right now but we still identify him as someone who just throws hands, Gege tries his hand with more overcomplicated power systems with characters like Gojo and Akari, where one of the many misconceptions arise. Just because something appears complex, it doesn't make it good quality wise, even if done right and if it does fit the overall ethos and personality of the character. Example, Yuki, who is hinted to be one of the strongest sorcerers out there, and in her first actual fight, she dies. Now, given what we understand about her power, she should have won that fight. But you introduce someone who we've been waiting to see in action for real, only to kill off to Kenjaku. Kenjaku. Like, cuz ain't even that crazy. But throughout that fight, I noticed a pattern. The depth of concepts of a power and a character structure that exists seemingly independent from the rest of the world only come into play at that specific moment and then to be discarded later. In this case, Yuki, a special grade sorcerer with an incredible curse technique and overall stat line, invokes much exposition only to die within this time frame. So we have this field of complexity confined within this space and doesn't venture beyond that. But we think just because it happened, oh it's Liddy. Man, hell no. Yuji was potential wasted down the drain, because this series is not about longevity, it's built upon its spontaneity and Gege is making up shit. That's why so many people get packed up or thrown to the side, which started in truth with Shibuya which I think is a pretty overrated arc, but that set up a many of Jujutsu Kaisen's many future failures and missteps. See, I say this because the Shibuya arc was an entertaining arc and nothing else, something the anime greatly amplified. But this is where Jujutsu Kaisen performed at its best for a consistent period. As far as the anime goes, it decided to have one of the most legendary continuous streams of episodes in recent viewing of anime. Why? Because within those 9 episodes, you had Gojo vs the Disaster Curses, Yuji vs Chozo, Toji vs Hanami, Toji vs Megami, Sukuna vs Jogo, and then Sukuna vs Maharaga. Of course we had the incredibly animated conclusive fight in The Brothers of Mass Destructive Hands vs Mahito, but we all know that if the creatives of MAPPA didn't do such a phenomenal job in delivering these fights, everyone would have been calling this genre flop, trash, basura, aburrido, all in words. It would have gotten the same treatment Turku Ghoul or Seven Deadly Sins got, and I think that strengthens my argument with how when you remove the combat and action of this series, particularly in the anime, it is a very, very boring series with a whole lot of nothing happening. And I know many of y'all may say, but it's a battle shonen, you shouldn't expect depth. But if you give on to depth in your series, guess what? I'm gonna critique it because that's what you've put in front of me. So when Gege does that, guess what? I'm about to critique it. Like, I can forgive Godzilla vs Kong having no story at all and the story being absolutely trash, but that's because we already know that coming into it and seemingly so do the producers, but Gege actively tries to showcase a level of depth and intellectualism and he fails more often than he succeeds. See there's this ongoing joke about how JJK fans always complain when there's a section of the manga we need to actually read it and I said that's not actually a joke but a reflection as to where the core interest is derived from, the action and the fights. But when you pour everything into that, the rest suffers. Binding vowels, the culling game rules, the point system, the varying complexities of certain domain expansions, they do not actually effectively help establish the greater narrative quality of the world of JJK because it was not built upon such intricate concepts of ideas. Especially with the culling games feeling not that different from the Shibuya arc when you really think about it. More so because after one fight, you're immediately thrown into the next fight and you see that happen all the time in the Cullen games, which is why it feels too much like the Shibuya arc. You're jumping from one fight to the next fight to the next fight. You go from one battleground of sorcerers versus cursed spirits to a free for all, which still kind of feels like sorcerers versus cursed spirits and other vessels like Yuji in a very strange point based game system, which doesn't feel authentic to the series. Now, the way this whole Cullen games arc was designed is something I'm not a fan of, but removing subjectivity from it, it feels like a very odd place to put a concept like this in a story like JJK, because while the intention is for Kenjaku to merge all of Japan with Tengen, the execution of it felt very complicated, not necessarily in understanding, but in terms of the way Keige had written it. It felt like a darker version of Greed Island meets a Battle Royale game, but didn't bring about the results to be as entertaining with the highlight fights that further pushed the arc. Victory!
The intermission in between that set up future events in the current game, such as Yuki and Cho's staying with Tengen, Maki running the gauntlet on the entire Zenin clan, and various other preparations, from a standpoint of a story and narrative, it really does and did fail to greatly establish the strengths of many of the priests and characters strictly due to the fact that everyone has a short lifeline. To where even Maki just feels like a forced necessity by having her nigh instantly be on par with Toji, someone who spent decades cultivating the skill to be who he is. And she becomes on par with them in like a couple weeks without enduring not even a percent of what we had to go through. A character built upon trauma, arrogance, and a misguided sense of identity was leveled with some 17 year old kid. It may be cool to watch, but when observed critically, Maki being the next Toji is fucking dumb and doesn't make any sense outside the fact that she also has a heavily restriction. Gege didn't develop her nearly enough to make that transition as warranted, deserved, or impactful simply because, once again, this just happens in JJK. To be someone like Toji, who is unironically one of the most important characters, if not the most important character in this show due to his actions, without any sort of personalized journey, even one which explores her psyche, is lazy and feeds into the fan service. While I understand the two were linked from birth, as long as Mai lived, Maki would never reach her full potential. But we're told this conveniently right before they're about to die. While we do see reasons that give on to this, like in that one flashback in that one episode, elements of abuse she suffered from that crazy Zen and lunatic, and how their father never really gave a shit about them, and honestly just disowned them from birth, they all make their way to us when it needs to happen and is beneficial to the story and not the characters. Just like Nobara, someone else who is barely even a character. She just happened to be around when things happened and didn't contribute much to the story. Then. Moments before her death, we get this contrived backstory into her life right before she died and we never see her again. And not only was it contrived but poorly executed as it introduced two random characters whose names no one can remember because they were forced into this very random element, this depiction of her life to give her greater depth that meant nothing. We just see her as this headstrong, no-nonsense woman that's her entire character. There is nothing beyond that and this backstory was supposed to go ahead and give us gravity to that. That failed incredibly. The same thing happened with Mai, where force development is pushed upon the viewer in a very limited amount of time and we're expected to care. And it's the same thing with Mechamaru as well. Like, do you see what I mean? Like, okay, you're a vegetable. You got your body back. I feel like that. What the fuck does Miwa gotta do with this? You don't develop the journey, you just info dump at the end. Gege just doesn't know how to write good characters, or at best, good characters with consistency. Even my boy Megami, look, I'm really trying to defend you, but you are just so, <laughs> you are ass. <laughs> like, dog, you, this is why you're called Potential Boy. Like, you were written up to have this amazing moment against this inky dinky curse spirit, where in truth, you abandon the notions of being inferior to others and you never rise to that occasion. And it's something that's never brought up again. Now, it would be dismissive of me to completely not talk about the other aspects of philosophy, spiritualism, or Buddhism that's actually illustrated in this series. It is in this aspect you do see elements of good writing from Gege. For example, in my Megami video, I do talk about how the concept of egoism being the driving strength of a jujitsu sorcerer, as it is something you're not only shown, but told multiple times. Gojo when he explained it to Megami, and Sukuna when he explained it to Jogo. The absolute confidence is a necessity when it comes down to engaging in combat, so you have to be the ultimate sensor of your power, otherwise you will be killed. Sukuna illustrates this the best out of every character in the show because he sees everyone as beneath him. But I do want to shed some light on these concepts and themes, and how they serve to strengthen the motivations of certain characters and their actions. Toto's We Are The Acceptance speech is also something that isn't at surface level after you do some digging into what it actually means. Toto is actually referencing a classical book in Japanese literature called The Tale of Haike, and while it is a paraphrasing of it, he goes, The sound of the Gion Shoujo bells echoes the impermanence of all things. The color of the silent flowers reveals the truth that the prosperous must decline. However, we are the exception. Now, the original quote per this translation goes, The Jadavana temple bells ring the passing of all things. Twin solid trees, white in full flower, declare the great man's certain fall. The arrogant do not long endure. They are like a dream in the one night of spring. The bold and brave must perish in the end. They are as dust before the wind. 
The first two lines of the saying are referencing the quote, but whether the latter exclaims the reality that no matter who you are, the strength you have, or your position in nature, it refers to the inevitable end of all things as to come. The unshakable foundation, the core of all things, understand, that does not change as all will end. The arrogant do not long endure, but to Toto, and to those like Toto, such rigidness and tradition phase through them. They are not bound by law, they are not bound by the standard or creed. They excel above such things through either earning the route of passage or being born in positions to do so, all by sheer belief and confidence that they are, among everything and everyone else, the exception. The arrogant do endure. Of course, outside the fact that Toto's character is one of the best suited for the remodeling of this quote, he along with a select few of the ones who really amplify this because of who they are. Hikari, Yuta, Yuji, Yuki, Maki, Toji, Confederate Ghetto, Sukuna, Gojo. They're characters that are agents of this exception, others more than some. They still represent that very theme of breaking tradition, with Gojo and Ghetto being the driving components of this. While their ideologies and ambitions greatly differ, their objectives parallel the desire to reshape the world for a collectivist image, to their respective causes, of course. Ghetto wanted a society free from humans, and Gojo wanted a society free from such structured hierarchical conservative values heavily imposed by Jujutsu FBI, so he could foster in a new era of strong and intelligent allies. And this is where things collapse again, because none of these things actually mean anything in the grand scheme of the story. We're enamored by such characters and philosophies, but they do not carry them out so we can strongly associate these ideas to them to where it actually affects the story. And then Geiga has no idea what to actually do with such characters or ideas, so he wastes them both and their potential. Spoiler alert! After Toto helps Yuji fight Mahito, he loses his hand and one of the best characters of the show is gone for over 100 chapters, only to come back in the most bullshit convenient way to where he has now utilized his lack of a hand to support and retrieve Yuji's allies. Damn, hand job. Where you come from? When I saw him come back and the manner in which he did, I exasperated and rolled my eyes because I knew Gege did not plan this at all or it was just very bad writing. You can take out one of the best characters in the show, not mentioned for 4 years and no one knows what he's doing, no one knows where he is, you don't do anything to lose return in a justifiable fashion, you just thrown back into the fray when there's pretty much no one left to fight Sukuna and expect us to get hyped because it's Toto. How did Toto acquire the idea to use an instrument for his technique? What type of training did he undergo? Who did he practice with? These are things that are just told and not shown, and they're told in cheap exposition boxes that thus expects us to be okay with it. That is awful writing. Disgraces Toto, and honestly, disgraces the fan of the series and Toto because this is the second time he's been used to appear conveniently as the Hero Saves the Day character, but this time around is far too contrived for me to actually understand it, at best and at worst to forgive it. It would have been a lot better if there were some subtle hints of Toto's existence sprinkled throughout the Cullen games, or if someone even mentioned an update on Toto, but he was seemingly wiped out from my memories, not even Yuji talked about him. And the worst part is, you bring him back into the spotlight just to take it away again, and then replace that spotlight with another character. See, this happens a lot in JJK, Nobara honestly should have stayed dead. Or at the very least she had been confirmed dead, as opposed to this whole is she alive, is she dead, it was a confirmed discussion. Because given events, if she comes back, it's actually game over for any type of redemption. She was given marginal depth right before she died and then we never see her again, and she's only referenced by Yuji when displaces indifference towards Kurosu, letting her know that she's not gang for real. Hell, even Geto is an example of this. I strongly believe Geto should have been the central antagonist of JJK and not some random creep who no one cared about. If we're following Geto's motivation from high school to the present, our association towards him as an antagonist would have been a lot stronger. His weight and association with Gojo and Jujutsu Tech would have had a strong significance both emotionally and narratively. But instead, we're forced to see Exhibition Guy yap on and on and on in boring sprees at a time. He cultivated this seemingly thousand year long plan just to get flanked by Yuta. Yuta, this body is 0-2 against this nigga. And soon after Yuta was done with Cuz, he went to go ahead and run the 3 on 1 with Yuji. Not only that, he nearly lost to someone who doesn't even fully understand how his cursed technique works. So you have one of these central antagonists who moved everything up to now dying in a forest after getting played around with with a comedian. The most we understand from Kenjaku is that he's really evil, really smart, and he has an evil plan, but died to a nobody? 
either Gege doesn't know what he's doing and he's making shit up or he's pre-planned this shit and this is the intended conclusion for these story arcs which is ultimately much worse and I say it a louder because there's a running joke that Yuji isn't the main character of JJK and I want to push back on that a little bit. JJK has a palette of revolving main characters but the story itself does not centralize on its protagonist who is Yuji. Yuji is the protagonist because the protagonist of a story is someone who's simply the agent who advances the story and affects major plot elements. Now this is where we get to the juicy part of the video because there's been a certain character I've been omitting this entire time. Just for a heads up, this entire section, it will be spoiler territory, so that's your last disclaimer. Satoru Gojo is easily the best and worst depictions of so strong I just don't know what to do with him I've seen in a story because he's literally the vocal point of not just the JJK world, but the entire series. He's the reason why the Shibuya arc happened, because Kenjaku orchestrated that entire scheme purely for putting Gojo in a box, the Cullen games. While it isn't happening because of Gojo on the hero side, that's all they really care about. And after they free him, the Khan games kind of stops being important and then it transitions into the next arc. <laughs> Gojo is the reason as to why the world of JJK is the way that it is. To where his birth alone altered the dynamics of the Jujutsu world, I feel like Gojo as a character has negatively affected the series more than he has positively because of how much importance is placed upon him to his actions, as we're still seeing in current chapters, are always related back to Gojo. There's no such thing as a fair fight if you're fighting Gojo on this Sukuna. He's literally Saitama because anyone he goes up against, he will win. When you have a character like that, it can be hard to put him in a scenario where fighting him makes sense. Toji needed ample prep time just to exhaust him and catch him slipping to take him out, but even then the boy bombs himself back to life when he ran the fate against the disaster curses, and not one of them posed a threat to him. When everyone's accomplishments are measured up to Gojo, it's going to be difficult to have a story where he's not in it. He's the fastest sorcerer alive. Aside Gojo, of course. No sorcerer has more cursed energy than him. Besides Gojo, of course. For a character Gege absolutely hates because of how difficult he is to write, you made that your own fault when this series is just where things revolve around the existence of this one man even if he's not there. And when that becomes the case, it becomes difficult to create much importance and emphasis for events that do not surround him. It's the reason why Gojo was put in a box so early in Shibuya arc because half of the fights would not have happened if he was around. But that's a problem because he's too central to the story to the point where he becomes vacant, the story remains, when is Gojo coming back? Hell, even when he died, there were a lot of people that still didn't believe it. Gojo was concealed in a box for four whole years and the second he came out of it, he was on smoke because sometimes you gotta pop out on show niggas and that was immediately exciting. It was not gonna set up him versus Akuna and he somehow appeared to be stronger than how he was when he was first put into the box. However, it was at this moment, my eyebrows began to raise because the second chapter after his release, he's about to fight Sakuna and then the chapter after that, the fight begins. So within two chapters of his release, he's now fighting the big bad boss. No build up, no lead up, no preparations, no strong interaction with other major characters such as Yuji. Just, we'll fight in two weeks and the fight commences two chapters later. That happens in succession with little to no room of digestion between moments. It'd be like if Aizen departed the Soul Society and then the second Ichigo steps into Hikamundo, he has his concluding fight with Aizen. For an event as big as Gojo coming back to immediately have him fight Sukuna without any type of introspection into Gojo as a character and his experience in the prison realm and an insight into his psychology and other social factors in a general way was a lazy amount of corners being cut. He only seemingly acknowledged Nanami Dan which gave greater corners is being cut and cringe to the idea that he didn't really care about anyone else outside of his immediate circle. I don't even think Nobra or anyone else even crossed his mind. Now before y'all nerds start malfunctioning your devices due to the excessive sweat trickling from your armpits down to your fingertips claiming I don't understand Gojo's character or it was explained in the flashback, both of those things are fallacious and I'm going to explain why a retrospective account of events does not aid to the story or the character in the context we're seeing. He had no interaction with Maki and how she killed his any clan, no interaction with Yuji and how he felt post Shibuya, but we see him talking to this old ass nigga from a place of understanding. This old old ass man who no one really acknowledged or really cared about up until he killed Masamichi. This old man who we've been seeing the bare minimum from because we see that Gojo acknowledged him more than anyone else within this time frame. How is that giving your most prized character justice when it comes down to establishing relationships with the other pivotal characters in the series? Then 
you have 13 chapters of Gojo Fire Sakuna only for Gojo to get off screened and the more you think about that, the more you think about that fight, the stupider it becomes. Gojo seemingly dog walks Sakuna, the one who needed Maharaka to save his ass multiple times, Gojo taking on a 3 on 1 whilst improvising on the spot, Gojo who, the chapter before his death, was seen to take the victory only to be introduced in the next chapter in an afterlife scene with Gojo contradicting himself and his own beliefs. Gojo is, next to Sukuna, conceit personified. He is arrogant, confident, and overly charismatic because he is someone who is the strongest sorcerer of today. He said to Yuji, I'd win against Sukuna. It might be tough though, but I'd still win, when he asked him. He told Sukuna and Kenjaku, infamously now, nah, I'd win, when asked if he thinks if he could take them both on. So tell me why. At the very end of it all, he states, I'm not sure it could have been him, even if he didn't have Megumi's 10 Shadows. First of all, you're right, you probably couldn't. But second of all, that isn't Gojo's character. Throughout the entire time we've seen him, he's never once displayed doubt in his ability. Only the complete certainty that he is the strongest and he will win. That was the zenith he reached when he learned reverse curse technique. Between heaven and the earth, I alone am the honored one is a testament to how he views himself and the world he is in. He is the strongest. He sees himself as the strongest. The world sees him as the strongest. The only one that doesn't is Sukuna. But that shouldn't matter to you. So how does it make sense for you to have this core component of your character, your code, contradict itself when you die? Because he didn't say it turns out he was stronger, he seemingly admits he was stronger than him from the beginning. So did he lie to us, to himself, or did Gage just forget Gojo's character to begin with? It was at that moment Gojo's character that lost his merit to me. And the worst part is that Nanami calls him out on another contradiction. In this afterlife state, Gojo goes on to this sob story about how he wanted Sukuna to not feel alone because he wanted to try and empathize with him, how being the strongest was a lonely title and how he wanted to be strong enough to reach Sukuna. Okay, random and weird and kind of abrupt for him to say that, but whatever. However, he wasn't strong enough to do so, but Nanami tells him, you live for jujitsu, you don't wield it to protect something, you use it solely for the sake of satisfying yourself, you're a weirdo. And Gojo looks embarrassed as if he's right and doesn't even defend himself because it's seemingly true. But if that's the case, what's up with Gojo's talk about wanting to cultivate a society of intelligent strong sorcerers to lead an age of new Jujutsu sorcery? Where he was saying that it'd be easy to kill off everybody but that wouldn't change anything. If his ambitions were really about changing the structure of the Jujutsu world, why have we never seen him do anything in that favor besides postponing Yuji's and Yuta's execution? There has never been an opportunity or chance to see Gojo live up to these ideals because they are not important to anyone, and anytime we do see him significantly, he's either fighting someone in a box or dead. When the theme of disbanding the hierarchy of the Jujutsu world is always brought up, there is no action or commitment to the cause, or in forms of literary techniques, it's never really expanded upon. Let me go back to that conversation Gojo had with the old man, there was so much potential down there to have this interpolitical dynamic of the old era versus the new era when Gojo openly stated to the old man that with these new uses of sorcery in the form of Yuta, in the form of Akari, in the form of Todo, Yuji and everybody else, you cannot contain it anymore and the curse spirits as well, everything is evolving and you guys are still too stuck on keeping things very contained, very traditional and very conservative, this hierarchy of power will no longer be a thing in the coming future. And it went nowhere. So when Nanami calls him out on this, you're kind of thinking, he doesn't have a point because Gojo is a hypocrite and he displays more egoism than the desire to bring about change. He has a point because the story is fucking dumb. It falls within itself because Gege at no point had any idea that this story would even last this long. So he's pulling shit out the ass and seeing what sticks. So we have the most important character dying off screen please understand that there were breaks in between this fight so if we look at the fight to when it truly started it happened on what chapter 224 which released may 28th and then concluded on chapter 236 on september 24th so in pretty much four months we were all watching this exciting fight only for it to end off screen are you playing with my dick what are you doing when i read that chapter i was baffled and then i said am i missing the chapter did i skip something this says 236, and our last one was 235. Am I missing something? And what's worse is that in Weekly Shonen Jump, Gege straight up says he feels like he forgot in the chapter. When I catch you, Gege, Gege, when I catch you, dog, when I catch you, bro, it's not going to be pretty, I promise you. If you remove the story from this fight, yes, it is so much fun to watch. But unfortunately, this is part of the story. So this is easily one of the worst fights in Jujutsu Kaisen contextually, and it did destroy Gojo's character to me.
Because it's not enough to just kill off the strongest character in the show and most beloved, along with the most important, but in that same chapter, have that clown Kashimo, the guy who fought farmers for a living, rush in to try and kill Sukuna after gassing himself up for god knows how long, only two, <laughs> and I'm not playing with you yo, to get off screened one chapter later. He lasted one chapter and he was still given the afterlife treatment. And you know what happens after that? Yuji, Higuruma, Hanakari all pull up in the same chapter. Oh my god, the story fucking sucks! We see the fight with the comedian and Kenjaku lasts longer than Kashima lasted against Sukuna. And then begins a repetitive, tiring, boring cycle of we see a character fight Sukuna, they do something cool. Trump cards, Sukuna takes him out. Another character pulls up. Trump cards, Sukuna takes him out. Another character pulls up. Sukuna. Rinse cycle repeat, rinse cycle repeat, it is awful. He's literally down there round through the entire cast at this point. And now Gage has written himself into a corner to where he's saying, oh shit, I don't know how this guy's gonna lose now. Which is why after Gojo died, Sukuna should have went off somewhere or everyone should have retreated. Some intermission should have been initiated because we have this tireless Sukuna who has fought everyone with no indication of slowing down. It's the same problem Kishimoto had when he had Mata fight everyone and then he died to some bullshit then Kaguya came out of nowhere. Oh no, but now it gets worse, because guess what, Gojo came back, but nah, it's not the Gojo we think it is, it's Yuta in Gojo's body. See this shit made me sit to my stomach how we see Gojo been through it, those lame editors that shown him jump, I knew that had to be an influence, even after yo different niggas had a plan to find everybody into it, trash ass fucking chap, I'm not gonna bit through it dog. I skipped through it. But see, I'm glad this happened because it's gonna save me time as to why this isn't good writing and how it destroys the foundations of whatever Gage tried to create. Because when we said Yuta is the next Gojo, I didn't think Cubs would take that shit seriously, so let me break down to you as to why this is bad writing. I've seen arguments of how people say this is great for Yuta, it's really depicting how he casted away his humanity becoming a monster like Gojo for all the pure intentions of winning against Sukuna, the parallels between Getsu and Gojo both having their bodies inhabited is such a masterclass writing, Yuta is really the gold and I. The reason why I say retrospective explanations are bullshit in this case is because what this does is try to give reason to a shit decision made in the past but justified as oh this was always bound to happen. So this is possible because they discussed beforehand that if Gojo were to die, Yuta would inhabit Gojo's body. In order to do this, Riku would have needed to eat Kenjaku, which might explain as to why they had the comedian play the role that he did, which leads to Yuta killing Kenjaku. Rika eating Kenjaku just in case things go south, which they do, and now they have the means to put Yuta in Gojo pause. All this is just messy, trash, and honestly dishonest the characters involved. The first obvious one being the fact that once again, they're using Gojo post-death and it showcases that he's a pivotal piece to making anything in the story run. Gege is still having to use him even when he's dead. He's created an antagonist so strong that when the strongest hero lost to him, you need to bring him back with someone else inhabiting their body. How was that a good character moment for Yuta? What aspect of Yuta's psyche indicated at any point in the story that this was the path geared for him or elevates him as an individual who exists independently from Gojo and not just as the second Gojo? It doesn't. In fact, this is the worst possible way because now he literally is Gojo. The second one is the fact that over 20 chapters ago, we just saw Gojo die and over 20 chapters later, we see him brought back again. So not only are we given no time to process the death, once again, of the most important character, but it almost feels like that death meant nothing since you're going to use him again anyway. If it was a case to where there was time in between this battle and the next one, and we see a much darker and desperate descent in real time of the Jujutsu squad initiating and executing this plan, then perhaps this moment would have had far more weight and significance. It would have really questioned everyone's ethics and morals about such things, as opposed to Maki going, this is inhuman, and Yusuke going, yeah, well, you know, deal with it, baby. There will be efforts to link back Yuji and Yuta's first initial meeting, and arguments will be made to when Gojo told him to take care of the first and second years if anything would have happened to him, but that is not an effective use of foreshadowing if the execution fails to deliver. This shift into creating a more emphasis on Yuta is not as valid as one may think because the elements that would make that argument strong aren't illustrated adequately enough to justify such a claim. This entire story is largely told not shown type of function. We're told Gaku Chaji is eligible to run the society even though Gojo was initially 
especially against such structures, but we're not shown anything about his character that depicts him as a good fit. We're just told Yuji has been practicing reverse curse technique, but we're not shown that. Of course, this backs up as to why I think there should have been more time spent with Gojo being released and between fighting Sukuna, because that way, making any type of remark to such things and then revealing it later on, it would have displayed a greater level of depth and consistency observed. But we never see Yuji train with anyone besides Gojo when he would pretend to be dead a little bit, kind of with Toto, and Kukasabe a little bit, kind of. I barely count that. Gege does this with damn near everyone, where he goes, yeah, these guys did a bunch of stuff off screen, but I've kind of alluded to it beforehand, so it's blessed. No, it's another method of cheap storytelling and artificial depth. And lastly, and I think the biggest one, with Yuta inhabiting Gojo's body, it completely nullifies the fight Gojo had with Sukuna beforehand. It nullifies the efforts of everyone else beforehand too, because while this is seen as a last ditch effort as a story, we just watched everyone get washed in a matter of what, 25 chapters just so Gojo can come back for round 2. And the worst part is, I feel no matter how this is played out, it would have been bad regardless simply because Gege wrote himself into this whole years ago and since then, it's been a struggle to climb out of it. We've seen everyone use their trump card, their special techniques, and it all meant for nothing. It's kind of like when Toto used his black fashion against Mahito and he kind of just brushed that off. That's what a lot of these techniques look like. Everyone's really putting in their all it meant nothing and now Gojo's back. See, I think what we can acknowledge here truly is that Jujutsu Kaisen doesn't have a story. It doesn't have anything to build strong enough on or believable enough to be taken seriously when you take the fights away. The characters are inconsistent and barely feel like characters at all. The setting feels vacant. Character motivations are largely in some way, shape or form tied to Gojo, like how the rest of the story is and therefore if he goes, so do major plot elements and motivations. Everything feels made up and not planned out and Gege will have these convoluted systems try and mask the absence of a story. Fairy tale is one of the worst stories I've read that got progressively worse and worse. But do you know what's facts? When we look at the elements that make a story, any story, and the literary values involved in just making something objectively coherent, Fairy tale is leagues better than Jujutsu Kaisen. Do you know how ass you gotta be to make that happen? Gaju is better written than the entire cast of JJK. Natsu is a better protagonist than Yuji. That annoying cat is better written than Nobura. Do you know how embarrassing it is to I can rationalize how the power of friendship defeated Akinologia more than how Sukuna beat Gojo? Now granted, I prefer JJK over Fairy Tale. I find it more enjoyable to digest. I don't have to think about anything when I watch this series, which is the appeal. I don't have to think about how stupid the story is or the characters are. With Fairy Tale, it was like Hiro tried to piss me off week after week after week, but there was still some effort into making the story, and even that had its highlights. But it's getting harder and harder to ignore these mishaps when they happen over and over again. And with the latest chapter, he's crossed a path where I can't even say JJK is good anymore. I like the fights, the music, and not much else, which is where I'm at. Which once again further elucidates how the argument of how you don't need to be shown everything or told everything, you gotta figure it out to understand the story that doesn't work because the elements that are put in place do not actually coherently align itself to where these things make sense. If this entire story is based on just implicit writing, I need to figure it out for yourself. I'm sorry, that's a bad story. This is not Elden Ring. It's not a Souls Bowl game where that's actually integral and built into the story and the function of where that gameplay comes from and that entire story. This is a narrative to where, as the author, it is your duty to help us understand and illustrate the motivations and the direction of the story that you're creating for us and you're failing to do so. So when you have to do multiple interpretations of the most basic of things, that's not a good thing, that's not a good story, and that's not good characters. All of this to say, is Jujutsu Kaisen the worst thing ever? No, of course not. It's a very entertaining anime. If MAPPA's creators weren't the artists they were and knew how to adapt things beautifully, I would have straight up ignored this series just like a vast majority of y'all. Because when these guys are not fighting, you're forced to listen to what they're saying and they're saying a whole bunch of nothing. I look at Jujutsu Kaisen the same way I look at Hitman Hala. No bars, our performance. It's an entertaining show with some of the best music I've heard in anime in recent years, incredible cinematography and voice talent, but nothing I praise about the show really comes from one, the manga, and two, the intrinsic qualities of the series itself. If the anime looked like Seven Days since Season 3, then none of us would care, but fortunately it looks and sounds really good, which is where a lot of people confuse why this show is good. It's a popular shot of whiskey and that's it. And you know what? 
To an extent, that's fine. This is literally a turn off your brain type of series. It's the pure essence of a battle shonen. Nothing more, nothing less. However, all that being said, even despite the bad writing and the nonsense that happens inside the show once you critique it, needless to say, if you enjoy this show, go ahead and enjoy this show. I'm going to keep it a buck because like I said earlier, this is one of the most exciting shows I've come out in recent years for anime. And if absolutely nothing else, the animation and the fights have some of the best I've seen in a long ass time. So that being said, as long as Jujutsu Kaisen keeps that up, you know, drop the ball, we in for a good time for the future. I ain't gonna lie, B, this took a brick to make word is bond. Sorry, I've been saying it all week. <laughs> Thank you all for watching the video. Thank you for sticking through to the end of the video. I'm sorry this one took a little longer than usual. I was trying out some new things with the editing process, but I'm glad with how it came out. And if you enjoyed it, I'm glad you enjoyed it. If you didn't enjoy it, hey, thanks for the views. Um, a quick promotion you know what i mean this video was sponsored by my discord yeah i know i finally made the discord i know if, a, a couple of y'all have been asking for it so i thought i'll go ahead and finally make that drawing out for y'all uh the link for that will be in the description below and i also put it for the community tab if y'all miss it somehow it's still under construction it's not no razzle dazzle i'm still working on it but y'all can go ahead and flood through and do what i need to do redux reference right for the next video what is your favorite anime and why? And for the next video, I'm going to have another special announcement. Announcement. Another special announcement at the end, so make sure y'all stay tuned. I'll be going ahead and disclosing that for that video. But, you know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm still keeping that under wraps until I go ahead and, you know what I mean, expose it. Anyway, thank y'all for watching the video. Thank y'all for sticking around. Thank y'all for subscribing. We're nearly at 20k, y'all are crazy as hell. And yeah, hopefully the next video won't take too long to come out. I appreciate y'all. Back to the shots I got.